I'm Laura Post, and I voice Aiko in Millennium Actress. She is very ambitious, um, and she's sort of, she's kind of a victim, I'd almost say, in this, in this situation. I know that she's definitely an antagonist to Chiyoko, but um, she gets used by the industry just like Chiyoko does. So there's sort of that aspect to her personality too. Um, she's proud and she's elegant and yeah, she's, she's, uh, she has a lot of things she wants out of her life, I feel like. What I find most interesting about Eiko is, is her overall character arc. And one of the things I loved about getting to play Eiko was getting to follow her through the, be, stay as her actress through the whole movie, uh, voicing her from when we first meet her until her last scene. Um, she, she sort of comes to a realization about what she's done with her life and how her choices have impacted others over the course of the movie in, in a way that uh, again is sort of like a, a antithesis, a foil to, to Chiyoko um, and it's just, it's, it's very fulfilling to get to play a character that sort of gets to have that kind of a moment and that kind of a self-realization. I think Eiko represents everything that Chiyoko could be if she weren't, um, you know, focused on her quest and the key. Uh, and what I mean by that, when I say could be, it's not as an aspirational goal, but as a, a story to be aware of and try to avoid, a fate to be avoided. Hers is a cautionary tale of what could happen to Chiyoko if she gave up on her quest and the key and, uh, you know, her love. Because uh, Eiko is, like I said, she's sort of, she has these goals and these ambitions, but she just kind of gets chewed up and spit out by the industry a little bit. And, um, you know, she has a lot of regrets about the choices that she made that brought her to that end, as opposed to how Chiyoko's story ends. Um, well, I, uh, I have played my fair share of villains, and um, she also has, so I understand that with her. Uh, you know, actually, it's um, funny, because I've had on more than one occasion had the callback for the hero, get cast as the villain experience. And so I kind of sympathize with her. I know it kind of stings, but that's kind of where I think we, we diverge is because she gets very bitter about it. And I like to just sort of enjoy whatever I'm cast as. And I don't have that sort of jealousy that she lets eat away at, at herself. You have to you have to have your own like self-love and self-confidence and joy in being that she can't seem to get her hands on as a character. Yeah, oh, it's so, oh, I love Millennium Actress. It's so beautiful and it's, I mean, I think the message of the whole movie is really powerful. Um, I, I believe in it myself. Uh, the, the idea that, you know, you, Chiyoko has her quest, and that's an important part of, of her, but she also has that sort of, like, confidence in herself. Like, she, it, when, when she's on her quest, she is confident and um, whole as a person when she has that key and she's on that quest. It isn't until she starts to sort of veer off that path that she loses that sense of self, I think. And I, I, the movie itself is just, it's a beautiful journey. I, I love the whole thing, how it's told and everything. <laughs> I love 
What I love about Millennium Mattress is how you can't tell what's real and what's movie. Like the lines are all blurred and it's sort of interesting because it's like you're viewing Shioko through a lens, which she has been viewed through a multitude of different lenses her whole life. And so instead of showing any one absolute truth, it kind of is showing, you know, every different character's perception of reality through all these different lenses. And it's just really fun and interesting. And it just sort of keeps you really engaged and, and opens up this sort of sense of wonder, I, I'd almost say, uh, in regards to her story. For me, I don't think I'd want to know. I kind of, the thing, the thing about the most important thing in the world is that it changes as we grow as people. So like 15 year old Laura's thing would be different than mine now. And I feel like if you know what it is, you kind of don't, if you've gotten like the most important thing, then well, what's the point in chasing less important things? So I feel like I would just want to kind of like Chiyoko, I'd kind of just want to keep the key and hang on to that and then maybe find out like at the very, 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 very end of my life. <laughs> if I knew when that was, that's, I think that would be the ideal way to do it um, for me. <laughs> for Aiko, I think that the box, well, I say a box, but you know, I don't know. I just imagine a key to a box um, <laughs> with an important thing in it. Aiko just wants love, and I feel like through her her story in the movie, she's she's looking for love from audiences and directors and fans and all these external sources. But I think what she needs is for her to love herself. But I don't know if that's what she like. If the box has what she wants, it would probably be adoration from fans. But I don't know if she'd be happy with what she wants. What she needs is to love herself. So, kind of a dual most important thing there. <laughs> Ooh, um, probably her final scene is the most significant just because it is the, the culmination of everything uh, that her character arc has been leading towards. Um, she's just so tired in that scene, <laughs> you know? And it's, it's a lifetime of struggling and scheming and trying to get this thing that she wants that she just can't quite reach and it's just that that weariness of finally the the bitterness and the jealousy and the struggle just wearing down on her until she finally is essentially dropping it all just dropping the front dropping everything she can't hold it up anymore and she's done and i think that's a really powerful scene for her. I really enjoyed voicing that scene. Um, I think that's probably my favorite scene for Aiko. <laughs> uh, I think that the reason, I think it's, I mean, I think it's a little of both. I think on the one hand, she, she does react to jealousy in a very, in my opinion, uh, self what's the, a self hurting kind of way like the she's not that that jealousy and that bitterness and that anger that she holds on to is just eroding at her own heart and soul and that just avalanches you know into this explosion <laughs> it avalanches into an explosion Anyway, but yeah, uh, she just, you have to like let go of all of that. Because the, the reason she's jealous is external. She can't help that the camera loves Chiyoko in a way that it just doesn't seem to love her and that she keeps getting cast as the antagonist. But she could, instead of choosing to take that situation and be anger and Anger, be angry and bitter and jealous about it and antagonistic towards Shioko, she could instead 
learn to enjoy the things that she is doing. And, and there's even a scene where someone's like, I love the stuff you do as the antagonist. And she gets very angry about it. Instead of enjoying that somebody likes her work, she uses it as another excuse to get upset. And that's, in some ways, it's a choice that she's making. So it's sort of both because, of course, ideally in her perfect world, she'd just be Chiyoko and get the lead in everything and be the romantic lead and the girl everybody wants to like save and love and date and whatever. But that's not what life has handed to her. So she could try to make the best of it, but she chooses to keep fighting against it and trying to get what Chiyoko has instead of enjoying what she has. My thoughts on Chiyoko's last words are that they are the truest like sentiment out there. The, the whole point of life is the journey and the chase and the idea that, um, you know, r reaching him isn't necessarily the goal. It's, it's the chase to get there. Like I um, sort of mentioned earlier, the, uh, knowing and having the most important thing in the world sort of makes everything else seem unimportant and dull and uninteresting. So why would you ever want that? The idea that you're trying to achieve more is what makes things fun. Um, from an acting perspective, I mean, I remember when I was like first getting my start and it was like, I just want to have like, you know, a part with a name and then it's like, okay, well now I want to have, I got that. So now, you know, the, the idea that there's always something new to want is what makes life interesting and fun. As long as you don't let it consume you and destroy you, it's a dangerous game, but it's a fun game, so. It might be naive, but I like to think that every person is capable of being forgivable. So, in my mind, yes, I think it is possible to forgive him. But it sort of depends on the person. I mean, if I were Chiyoko, it would be very hard. But I'd like to think that I could. But I guess I wouldn't know if I was really in that, until I was really in that situation, which hopefully I never am. <laughs> oh, I don't think Eiko would have any forgiveness for him. I mean, I'd like to think that she could, especially if we get to older Aiko. Maybe older Aiko could, but young Aiko, definitely no forgiveness to be had. <laughs> so I feel that the witch's curse is actually sort of a, a combination of Aiko and Otaki. That's his name, right? The 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 sun that yeah yeah because the witch in the story in the context of the movie like betray tricks her and betrays her and the combination of Eiko who's like I hate you so much I can't bear it and Otaki who's like I love you so much I can't bear it also trick Chiyoko so it's sort of foreshadowing for that later so that's sort of what I think that is as far as that that sentiment of like I think it's the two of them like I, I hate you so much I can't bear it and I love you so much I can't bear it Conspi working together to destroy Chiyoko's spirit that's that's my thought at least I'm sure other people have other opinions I think Eiko's curse is just like um, Chiyoko's constantly chasing for eternity, it feels like. Uh, Eiko is constantly working against Chiyoko. Like, she can't escape trying to destroy Chiyoko, both in films and in her life. It's that, it's that choice that she's made to, to be jealous and not be happy and uh, to try and destroy what she perceives as being in her way. And she's just doomed to do that for seemingly all eternity until she finally can come to a realization that 
what Chiyoko has isn't what she wants. Kind of like how Chiyoko has to come to the re realization that the chase is what she's wanted all along. Eiko needs to come to the realization that her chase is pointless and that she needs to just appreciate what she has instead of trying to destroy the person that has what she thinks she wants. I think it's very bittersweet because she realizes so late in the game for her what she what she has done and what she did wrong and what all the time that she's wasted being angry and jealous and bitter. But I also think that it's it's good that she I'm glad that she comes to that realization and sort of is able to end that cycle even if only, you know, at the only at the tail end of things, but at least she's able to finally put an end to it and hopefully start to appreciate herself a little bit more and not keep looking for external sources of validation and love and adoration. So, yeah. Um, yes, it's, uh, when you say classic movie, everyone like thinks of like black and white movies and things like Casablanca and stuff, but my classic movie is The Little Mermaid. <laughs> Disney's The Little Mermaid. Um, it both played a huge part in me wanting to be a voice actor, but also, uh, as far as my childhood goes, I was, I was a pretty overweight kid, and I got bullied and picked on a lot as a kid. And um, when I saw The Little Mermaid as a kid, I, uh, I saw a story about, it, it's funny because people have a different interpretation than I do, but when I saw it, I, I saw the story of this, you know, handsome prince that falls in love with this person's voice and doesn't know what she looks like at all. And then she like, she gets onto land and she's like, I'll just, he'll see me and he'll love me, but he's so in love with this girl's voice that it doesn't matter what this beautiful girl looks like at all. It's not the girl he fell in love with. And it's not until she gets her voice back that he is like, oh, it's, it's, her I mean he realizes like right before she gets her voice back because he was gonna go up to the castle and whatever and then magic happens and stuff but the point is that it made me feel like oh look someone could theoretically actually love me regardless of what I look like because he fell in love with someone without knowing what they looked like and this was before the internet so <laughs> there's not that you know idea out there but um, yeah so it really like brought me like a lot of comfort as a kid and also got me really interested in music and thereby also acting and my voice and and I knew that I wanted to it was a huge part of me wanting to be a voice actress was that like I loved that movie so much and I wanted to essentially voice Ariel of course she already has a voice but that was like one of my six-year-old brain's goals <laughs> Yes, well, obviously, I admired Jodie Benson because she was the voice of The Little Mermaid. And I know, like, I, I really liked a lot of voice actors as a kid, which most kids didn't know the actors behind the voices. But um, I also was a huge fan of Rob Paulson, who was Raphael from the original Ninja Turtles. And he was also Mighty Max. And he was also Yakko from Animaniacs. Big fan of his work and another big inspiration for me wanting to be a voice actor. And then... I also was a big fan of Leonardo DiCaprio, and not everyone's like, I know, everyone's thinking Titanic, of course. She's like, oh, he's such a dreamboat, but actually I wasn't, like I didn't have a crush on him, I was just like, he's such a good actor, because I really liked him in Romeo and Juliet. And so I was like, he's so good, and he was one of those few actors I would like go to see the movies that he was doing, even if I wasn't necessarily interested in the movie, because I just really liked to watch him work, and that kind of, still is the case now. I just really like his work, generally speaking. There, there are movies that I don't like, but you know, they happen. Um, but yeah, so that's for a normal on-camera actor, I guess, if those are important or whatever. <laughs> hmm, I think it would be called Trying Her Very Best, <laughs> The Laura Post Story. Because I feel like that is me my whole life. I'm just, I'm really, I try really hard. I don't always succeed, but I do try really hard. Either that or um, 
maybe faith trust faith trust in pixie dust because i really love peter pan a lot and i i try to have faith in myself and trust in other people and then you know pixie dust is just a little extra bit of magic thrown in for fun <laughs>